Hello, and welcome to this NGCU Center for the Arts digital event. We would like to ask everyone to please keep your cameras and microphones off during the program. There will be a Q&A section at the end of the program, and we will only be accepting questions and comments via the chat window. At the bottom of your screen if you are on a computer, or possibly the top right if you are on a different device, you should be able to see an option for chat. If you click that, it will open the chat window where you can type your questions so that they may be read aloud and answered. Thank you, and enjoy the event. Please note, the views and opinions expressed in this virtual event and presentation are solely those of the individual artists in their personal capacity and are not reflective of nor represent official policy, position, or views of New Jersey City University. Good evening and welcome to this birthday celebration for the milk of almonds. Not every book gets a birthday party, but we felt that the milk of almonds uh, um, deserve one. And um, as I was getting ready for this evening, I, I reread um, um, the introduction that Luis de Salvo and I wrote, and I was trying to remember um, what motivated us, what led to the making of this book. Um, what were the ingredients? Well, there was food, there was memory work, women, Italian-American identity, community, invisibility, desire for recognition, and also a need to change the Italian-American narratives around women, both those that were dominant within American culture at large, and those also those dominant within Italian American culture. And of course, we were the women to do it. Luisa Salvo and I have been friends for a few years. I have written about her work um, and we would often talk about whatever we were writing. We would talk about Italian American literature and we would eat food and cook food and enjoy food. And we knew many women who had uh, an equally passionate relationship to food, uh, but a relationship to food that also did not mean they maintained a traditional relationship to domesticity. And so we started thinking about a book, an anthology. An anthology creates a community. It also can transform a community. And The Milk of Almonds was born out of that desire to represent ourselves and make ourselves visible as a different kind of community. We had the good fortune of reaching out uh, to writers with whom uh, both of us had been in conversation for a number of years, uh, and those writers were the first to join us in the project. Uh, but we also invited many, many other writers. In fact, in the initial stage of um, of this book, uh, um, we had approached the press uh, um, that was very interested in the project, but wanted uh, a smaller anthology with perhaps uh, 10 pieces by well-known uh, writers. So, but we wanted a book that was truly representative and diverse that covered uh, various experiences that covered the nostalgia that sometimes accompanies our relationship to food, um, the violence, the joy and the sorrow, um, the predictable and the unusual. And we also wanted to cover regions, different parts of the United States and age. We were very, very interested in uh, including the perspectives of young writers. And in fact, at the time we included the two young writers who were who had been students at New Jersey City University. They've been students in my memoir classes, Rosanna Colasurdo and Lauren Lipari. And for this reason, um, I'm delighted that um, the person who will host this event tonight is Kaylee Morell, a reader of The Milk of Almonds, a reader of Luis de Salvo, a student, and a writer. So I'm going to invite her uh, to join us and then to host this evening together. Kaylee? Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Junta. Um, I'm very excited to be here tonight with all of you to host this reunion and conversation. 
Um, so I just want to speak a little bit about the book and then I'll be introducing our guest tonight. Um, in 2002, the feminist press published The Milk of Almonds, Italian American Women Writers on Food and Culture, an anthology of memoir, fiction, and poetry by 54 writers. Editors Luis de Salvo and Edward Junta aimed at subverting conventional narrative of food, gender, and ethnicity. The anthology included established and emerging authors, including many authors who had not yet published a book. 20 years later, one of the editors and several of the contributors are coming together to reflect on the cultural significance of this groundbreaking anthology and the community it helped to forge. I'll now be introducing our guests and then we will have them each read excerpts of their pieces. First, we have Phyllis Capello. Phyllis Capello is a NYFA fellow in fiction and a winner of an Allen Ginsberg Poetry Award. Her collection, Pack Small, Plays Big, is from Bordighera Press, 2018. Her poems appear in The Dream Book, From the Margin, The Milk of Almonds, Embroidered Stories, Ping Pong, The Well and Often Press, and The New York Quarterly. She is a writer in residence with Community Word Project and has entertained children in hospitals since 1982, currently as a red nose doc with healthy humor. Thank you so much for being with us today. Next, we have Nancy Coronia. She is an associate professor in the Department of English at West Virginia University. She is the co-editor of Personal Effects, Essays on Memoir, Teaching, and Culture in the Work of Luis de Salvo. And she wrote the introduction for the reprint of de Salvo's only novel, Casting Off. Twice nominated for a Pushcart Prize, her creative writing has appeared in numerous anthologies and journals, including Bio Stories, New Delta Review, Tell Us a Story, 94 Creations, Italian Americana, and VIA. Thank you for being here with us today. And now we have Edvid Junta. Edvid Junta is a professor of English at New Jersey City University, where she teaches memoir as well as other creative writing and literature courses. She is the author of Writing with an Accent, Contemporary, it uh, contemporary Italian American Women Authors and the co-editor of many anthologies, including the Milk of Almonds, Italian American Women Writers on Food and Culture, edited with Luis de Salvo. Personal Effects, Essays on Teaching, Memoir, and Culture in the Work of Luis de Salvo, and the recently published Talking to the Girls, Intimate and Political Essays of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. Now we have Joanna Claps Herman. Joanna Claps Herman has had 35 short prose pieces and poems published during the COVID era in Odyssey PM, Pomerola, The Ocean State Review, Italian Americana, Persimmon Tree, and Fatal Flaw Literary Magazine. Her book-length publications include When I Am Italian, Quando Sono Italiana, exploring the question of whether it's possible to be Italian if you weren't born in Italy, No Longer and Not Yet, and The Anarchist Bastard, Growing Up Italian in America. She has co-edited two anthologies, Wild Dreams and Our Roots Are Deep with Passion. Now I'll be introducing Maria Lorino. Maria Lorino is the author of the national best-selling memoir, Were You Always an Italian? As well as Old Daughter, New World Mother, a mediation on contemporary feminism. Her book, The Italian Americans, A History, was the companion to a national PBS documentary. Maria's forthcoming book, The Price of Children, will be published in Italy next September by Longanesi. Her journalism has appeared in numerous publications, including The Village Voice, New York Times, Washington Post, and The New Republic, and her essays have been widely anthologized. She teaches creative writing, creative nonfiction in the undergraduate writing program at NYU. Thank you for joining us today. And now Nancy Savaka. Along with international screenings and honors, Nancy Savaka's films, True Love and Household Saints are listed in the New York Times Guide to the Best 1000 Movies Ever Made, and True Love was named one of the 50 greatest independent films of all time by Entertainment Weekly. HBO's If These Walls Could Talk won multiple Emmy and Golden Globe nominations. Reno, Rebel Without a Pause, Unrestrained Reflections on September 11th, was awarded the Seal of Peace by the city of Florence, Italy. Dirt, a bilingual dramedy on immigration, won Best Director at LA Latino Fest and a Writers Guild nomination. Savaka's archives are part of University of Michigan's Film Mavericks collection, which holds the works of Orson Welles, Robert Altman, and her mentors, John Sales and Jonathan Dem. Thank you all so much for being here with uh, today. 
Um, I now invite you to read your excerpts from The Milk of Almonds, and we will start with Phyllis Capello. Good evening, everyone. It's such an honor to be here with all of you and to be part of this classy, meaningful anthology that is still making community and holding space for folks, some who are absent from our lives for different reasons. Eddie, you've helped me make both art and friends. Thank you. I had such a rich experience rereading the work on so many levels, I started to rethink my own young relationship to food and culture. Like others here, mine was not entirely happy or comfortable. In fact, all these years later, I realized why it was I came to write about Jeannie. Not only as an uneducated young worker in a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood and city, but her snowy walk through Brooklyn streets without proper clothes, how she was the teenage head of a family and the subsequent loss of home and culture that followed. My poem here is called Jeannie. Jeannie walks to work on snowy days when the bus doesn't come. The stretch from home past bodegas, factories, the broad graveyard is three miles of trudging, hands in pockets and two cigarettes, the strong kind, drawn deep, smoke twirls up, her belly growls, but at the store, they let her eat. Halfway there and it's snowing harder, cars struggle up the hilly streets, wide flakes cobweb her hair. The city turns from ghetto to fairyland. She wishes she'd taken the old boots her mother offered and the ugly red hat. Deliver deliveries will be late, she thinks, unlocking the riot gates. Schools will probably close. She eats two cupcakes, lights up, watches the store cat purr over his bowl. Ma's partying again and little Julie's got a cold, but she lets that go, thinks for a moment about winning the citywide, sweet arc of the ball dropping clean through the rim the beautiful cheering. All day over the register bent low, she will tally and pack. The same old lady will wander down the bread aisle like a lost child. The cat will twirl himself between her long legs. And today, like yesterday, she'll let the gypsy kids steal another box of high priced cookies. The next poem is called Working Men. I've lived with several males who had to divide their days into delivery schedules and city traffic. My son's this kind of gig worker still. The everyday matters of sustenance matter a lot to them. Working men. <clears throat> they are the kind that whistle, crisp in blue-gray uniforms. They warble unnameable melodies. Streams of notes, incomprehensible as birdsong, trail them. Dollies piled high, they shuttle between double park trucks and shop doors, delivering everything, teeth, yarn, vitamins. They know everyone's name. How's it going, Al, they say. What's shaking, Lou? Midst rattling plates they, and mumbled news, they'll have the meatloaf at the diner in December, eat a sandwich on a shady bench in June. Their days divide into traffic lights, routine runs, coffee breaks, available bathrooms. Nothing hurts them yet. Their legs are strong, their arms well-muscled, eyes still keen, unspectacled. They could go to war, play baseball at picnics, make their pretty wives moan in thankful rapture. When they get home, the youngest ones clamor at the door, lifting up their red, red lips for kisses. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading. Um, I now invite Nancy Karunia to read her excerpt. It's an honor to be here and I look forward to our discussion afterward. This is from an excerpt from a piece called Go to Hell, one of the first pieces that I ever wrote. And I'm really honored that Louise and Eddie accepted it for this anthology. I think it's self-explanatory. When I was about seven years old, my cousin Maddie burned herself on my grandparents' barbecue grill at the backyard party they had at their house in Woodside, Queens, late 60s suburbia. Some of us were playing tag and she ran right into the hot grill that grandpa had placed in the middle of the driveway after he'd cooked all the sausages. Grandpa laughed when Maddie ran into the grill. 
She was running backwards away from our other crazy but cute cousin Joseph, who was it in our game of tag. Grandpa cornered Maddie between the grill and the house, teasing her, serves you right for playing rough. You wanna play rough, you're gonna get burned. And he laughed louder as he pushed against her arm where the second degree burn was beginning to blister. All the cousins were yelling at him to stop, but Maddie was defiantly silent, not shedding even one tear as he taunted her. Finally, Aunt Helen, Maddie's mother, came running from the kitchen where all the women were washing the dishes and pulled Maddie away from him. Leave her alone, Pops. Gee, she's only a little girl. Grandpa reached out for my aunt and said, don't talk to me that way. I'm not your husband, I'll smack you. And he picked up a nearby broom and tried to swat her with it while his sons drank their Rheingolds and watched from the backyard. Many years later. I was about to walk away from his hospital bed when grandpa placed his arm around me in a chokehold, a position he enjoyed administering in my younger days. He was too small now, too weak, but his arm lay heavy on my back. I gave in to his weight and leaned in closer. I waited for words that would change the way I thought of him, words that would erase the past. I turned to look at my godfather, Uncle Ed, and his wife, Aunt Mimi, hoping for some help. Grandpa wasn't speaking, just looking at me, and he began to caress my hair. I felt suffocated. It felt familiar, and my impulse was to bolt from the room without looking back but it was more important at the time to stay and get the message for my father, that the message that would make sense of my grandfather's cruelty. I would be the receptacle, tell my father grandpa didn't mean it, he never had. I tried to cut off the death that surrounded him and waited for the sacred message. Grandpa, what do you want me to tell my father? You said you had something you wanted me to tell him, what is it? He stopped playing with my hair. Tell your father, he started, then stopped, hesitating for only a second. You sure you're Frank's daughter, right? I was losing my patience with this old smelly man and my voice came out short. Yes, grandpa, what do you want me to tell him? And then he spat it out, surprising us all. Tell your father, go to hell. He laughed loudly, tell him, go to hell. He repeated it over and over, sing song like a nursery rhyme. Tell him, go to hell. Tell him, go to hell. I lifted my arm away and stepped back across the room. My Aunt Mimi shook her head back and forth. Pops don't mean it. He don't mean that. Uncle Ed said, you'll have to tell your father. Thank you. Thank you for your powerful weaving, Nancy. Um, I now invite Dr. Junta to read her excerpt. Well, I have read this piece, edited this piece, and Nancy every time. I've taught it every time. Thank you. Thank you for letting us have it for the milk of almonds. So this is uh, from the ending of, um, of the memoir. Um, that appears in the milk of almonds called the jar of memory. My mother knew that in my adult life, I would not be going to the garden to fill hundreds of bottles with tomato sauce. Sure enough, cans were making their way slowly but surely into Sicilian kitchen cabinets, even eventually my mother's. And I, like my sisters, was meant for other work, other places. We were meant for fast-paced lives. We were meant for homes far away from the Sicilian garden, its rhythms, its rituals. So my mother never taught me how to perform the summary miracle of the transformation of tomatoes into the sweet condiment of winter days. The tomato ritual, the garden stand precariously on the edge of memory. And I, I watch from a distance Fragments of summer days flicker, linger flirtatiously, but vanish when I try to grasp them, leaving me empty handed and alone. The jar is gone, stolen. The house in the garden is falling to pieces. It is dangerous to go inside. 
there is no roof at the center. You walk inside, look up, and there is a blue sky staring back at you. Vegetation is sprouted from the ruins, wild and thick, embracing a broken chair, the leg of a doll, a rusted pot. Part of the house is gone. The room I share with my older sister, the living room, my parents' bedroom, the kitchen. But the hallway and the dining room are still there, and my mother stubbornly goes inside despite the danger. My younger sister, when she visits, yells that she's crazy, but follows her inside nonetheless. Back at the garden recently has not pictures, an observer, cautious, respectful, distant. I linger at the back of the house, by the wall of what used to be my parents' bedroom, near the window that was kept shut to keep out the heat. The window looks at me, sad and disconcerted by its own aging and disintegration. Rusted nails hold the corroded pieces of wood by stubbornness so old, so familiar. My fingers caress the rough, cracked surface, I want to kiss it, kneel down, pray, mea culpa, so sorry for your death, so sorry I left, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. I press my palms against the wall of the house, scratch a stone surface, the dust gets underneath my nails, settles into the crevices of my skin, and I tread on my own bones. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jinta. That was beautiful. Um, Joanna, would you like to read your excerpt? It would be my great pleasure. Um, I, I guess I want to say a couple of things unprepared, but to say without this community, I wouldn't have a writing life. I know that. Without Eddie, I would be lost on the road. Word by word, sentence by sentence, listening to all of you tonight. What I'm realizing is we have built our own country out of our language. And it's a country we need out of the losses our grandparents, our parents, our ancestors suffered. I'm so grateful for this. <laughs> Love profoundly listening. It's just so beautiful to hear you all. So my essay is about coffee and my mother and her sisters every single weekday afternoon before the men came home from work, sat down to have coffee and. And this, we don't get much close to the, the food, but just the introduction and the background to their ferocious ways. Coffee and sugar were the narcotics that stimulated the days and nights where I learned about intimacy in that great and demanding school, my Italian family. The mothers all drank pot after pot of coffee throughout the day, from when they woke early in the morning until very late at night when they fell into bed exhausted from their caffeine-fueled, furious days. With the coffee always came the end, a couple of times a week we baked, so there would always be Anne, that little bit of sweet something that inevitably accompanied the many cups of coffee they drank to keep themselves bound to their relentless routines. We used the recipes my illiterate grandmother carried in her head, mustachul, pizza dolce, torta di ragotta, carta dad, intimacy and coffee, and were inextricably connected in my family. The chemistry, the caffeine, the sugar, and the connection with one another, so intense as to make us vibrate, combining as they did with a rage for perfection. This made for standards of behavior so exacting, so naturally inevitable, that we threw ourselves at every task, work, or play ferociously and with a blind certainty that this was the only reality. Nothing was relative. Everything was absolute. Must and should was the air we breathed. 
On the pig farm where my mother grew up, they drew their own water from the well, baked their weekly bread in the brick oven my grandfather built. They rose at dawn to milk the cows, collect the eggs. After school, they weeded the garden, cleaned the chicken coops, helped with the endless chores on the farm life. One summer during depression, they spent hours in intense heat picking bones out of the pig manure because my grandfather heard he could earn money for bags of bones. They grew their own food. And in addition to all the everyday cooking, they made their own sausage, prosciutto, many kinds of cheeses, of course, their own wine. My mother's generation grew, grew up with screaming as an ordinary response to even minor deviations from these ancient ways. This drove them to such heights of great accomplishment. Whatever they undertook, they did flawlessly. They were accomplished seamstresses, amazing cooks, wonderful hostesses, extraordinary gardeners. They were beautiful, strong, hardworking, and they had no idea that they were allowed to take any credit for this. This was just the way things were done. No time for credit, had to get the next job done. If a child broke a rule or a dish, get over here, who broke this cup? How did this happen? Come here, right way, I'm gonna kill ya. The hot cupped hand hung in the air, the polyad was coming, or the twist of tight screen, skin between your mother's fingers. In my generation too, these were our days. We worked alongside the grown-ups. We canned the tomatoes, the peaches, the pears, pickled the eggplant, made the jam. For fun, we made our own liqueur, fresh pasta, baked panettone, abits, bread, focaccia, brigotta, scamots, and provolone. But it wasn't as if we didn't play. We played ferociously. When we swam, we swam to the farthest shores, learned to do the most complicated dives, elaborate skating tricks. When we climbed trees, we raced to the highest limbs. When we all gathered for our Memorial Day picnic, there was first an, the homage to America, bowls of chips, trays of nuts, dips, bowls of macaroni, salad, potato salad, trays of coal cuts. But then the real food followed, trays of managot, lasagna, meatballs, sausage, roast chicken with potatoes, sausages with onions and peppers, hot coffee carried in jars, wrapped in mapines to keep it warm, gallons of lemonade, orangeade, iced tea, the bottom of each jar coated with thick syrupy layers of sugar, platters of desserts. If hard work was our code, not taking credit for that work was even more important because calling attention to yourself was a sin. Can you imagine? She had to go brag about her sauce. Hey, we all make sauce. Who does she think she is? So conceited. It was the hidden price of silence that was the most exacting. Fueling this illusion of ordinary and easy perfection meant you weren't allowed to get credit for what you naturally worked so hard to do. Instead, there was only blame for trivial failures. Perhaps we thought, that if we were silent, maybe someday we would be declared good. But to my knowledge, no one ever was. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, I also wanna speak a bit to um, what you said at the beginning of your reading. Um, I wanna congratulate, congratulate you all for being a part of this community for Italian American women writers and also creating a space where these kinds of stories can be shared. Um, and you should all be very proud of yourselves for contributing to this. Um, and now, Maria, I, I invite you to read your excerpt. Oh, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. And it doesn't feel like 20 or so years ago when this came out. I remember so well working with the great Louise de Salvo and amazing Eddie Ginta. Um, to put this excerpt in context, I had just described a scene in which I was um, with my brother who was eight years older than me and his friend. And I was trying to tell his friend that my absolute favorite food in the world was chicken feet. And my brother had his hand on my mouth to stop me from saying that in our waspy neighborhood, people did not eat chicken feet. Here's the excerpt. 
Our ancestors were people who worked the land. And even if my father had been born in Milburn, New Jersey, even if he had never touched the hilly terrain of Piterno in Southern Italy that yielded barely enough crops for them to eat, somewhere deep in his blood was the instinct to pick edible food wherever it was available. As a boy, my father worked weekends as a caddy at a fancy golf club that restricted Italian Americans and other swarthy types. An enterprising 12 year old, one day he discovered a fertile patch of green off the silky 18 hole course. He quietly sat on this less traveled path and began to pull up chicoy, our dialect word for dandelions that are eaten as a salad. What are you doing? asked one of the golfers who happened to walk by. I'm picking these for tonight's dinner, he replied. You eat grass, the incredulous golfer replied. Yes, my father nodded, too embarrassed to explain the satisfying bitter taste of chicoy or lie when caught green handed. The shame that my father must have felt on that golf course as a child was in a diluted form passed along to me, contained in the narrow grip, the nervous grip of my brother's hand on my mouth. My father munched on weeds. I ate the feet of chickens. Neither was appropriate in our town, either in the roaring 20s or with the rebellious 60s. My brother recalls that my mother never caught chicken feet again after that Joey Unger incident. My parents were mortified to have been caught serving such a low rent meal. Their shame turned everyday acts into small secrets as we lived out the stereotype of trusting only the family. Don't mention our foods. Don't use our dialect words. This decision caused some emotional trepidation because I would find myself refrain, refraining from mentioning subjects as innocuous as a dinner meal. How could I tell friends that my dinner had been a dish made with cucuzil? The word sounded more like baby talk than baby zucchini, cucuzielli in dialect, I discovered years later, which my mother sauteed with peppers, onions, and egg, calling the mixture jumbot. I had to devise my own rules of nomenclature. If asked about last night's supper, I would describe in general terms what I had eaten, but I'd never assign a name to the dish. Lettuces seemed bound to get my family in trouble in America. In high school, I became friends with an Italian-American girl whose parents lived on the right side of the tracks, but still indulged in, I discovered, the foods of the wrong side. Do you eat beans and greens, she asked me one day. What's beans and greens, I replied. Oh, that's a soup my mother makes with escarole and beans. Manest, I thought to myself. I finally met someone who else who eats manest. I love manest. My mother made it every Monday night, this thick soup of escarole cannellini beans soaked in olive oil and sliced pepperoni, which we sopped up with chunks of soft Italian bread. It was considered a poor person's soup because of the ingredients were so cheap. Manest from the dialect word manesta, which means vegetables boiled for soup, look quite unattractive, with lumps of mushy white beans separating from their filmy skin in and seaweed colored escarole floating in the plate. To me, Minest was a delicious mess. I love the dish, but we'd never mention it to anyone. Beans and greens, however, sounds an American, sounded fine to say. Thank you so much, Maria. And now Nancy Savaka, if you would like to read. unmute myself I did I want to thank you all um, for doing this and 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 for uh, us all gathering together this feels so beautiful um, 20 years later I can't believe it either um, but I, I have to also thank Eddie in particular because I think you are such an enabler of writers um, you you are have been an inspiration to me um, you know, when you write screenplays, you don't consider yourself a writer. Uh, those are like maps that we make. And the, it's not usually not the, the last thing that people see. People don't read that writing. So to invite me to join you guys um, and to write with you was such an honor then and continues to be an honor now. And I'm hearing all your stories now and incredibly moved by them. And I'm very, very grateful to be a part of this. So thank you. Um, so I have two, two short pieces and I'm wondering, uh, Eddie, do you have a preference for hearing about artichokes or ravioli? It could be the one. <laughs> so I guess I'll do, I'll do ravioli because I was younger for that. Um, I was three years old when Martha, my then teenage sister was going out with her future husband, Vinny. Vinny was a recent immigrant from Potenza near Naples. My sister, like the rest of my family, was a recent immigrant from Argentina. The reason why she could even communicate with Vinny was because Martha had spent much of her childhood with our nana and learned to speak the Sicilian language from her, a language which in our Bronx neighborhood, she quickly converted to Neapolitan for survival purposes. 
Marta and Vinny were in love. My father, like all Sicilian fathers, couldn't bear to think of his daughter being pursued by any guy. And as a result, my sister became an excellent liar. She would rip the pages out of her school notebooks so that she could say she needed to go to the store to buy a new one. She invented movie plots of films she'd never seen. She gave detailed descriptions of class trips that she never took. This would usually work incredibly well, except for those times when my parents, maybe suspecting that something they couldn't quite know for sure, would yell out to her as she ran out the door, take the baby with you. The baby meaning three-year-old me. So I vividly remember this particular day when Martha told me and my parents that she was taking me to the movies. It was some cartoon thing, she said. I was beyond ecstatic since my sisters, when they usually did go to the movies, would deliberately bypass the kids' films and take me to see Hitchcock or Splendor in the grass type movies, which I couldn't make heads or tails of. So I eagerly went with Martha and was mystified when we walked right past the Lowe's Theater under the L and headed for one of the residential side streets. She hurried me up a flight of steps leading to this weird brownstone building, much smaller than our tenement. And we walked inside and someone opened a door to a tiny apartment in the living room, a fancy table had been set up. It was covered with a lace tablecloth with plastic over it. And I saw a lady that I later learned was Vinny's sister, Giovanna, whom he lived with. And two noisy toddlers were running around and someone lifted me onto a chair with the yellow pages on the seat so I could reach the table. My sister, giddy with nerves, tied a cloth napkin like a bib around my neck. I didn't know where I was or what exactly was happening. And I didn't have much time to think because all of a sudden, a plate of hot ravioli materialized on the table in front of me and the steam from the plate and the aroma of Giovanna sauce hit me and it made my eyes and mouth water. I was the worst finicky eater, but Giovanna had touched on my only weakness. Pasta was the only food that I would eat. I grabbed my fork and I was about to spear ravioli when I felt the sting of a smack, my sister hissing at me, wait for Giovanna to sit down. This was unfair. Suddenly I was starving. I swooned from lack of food and Giovanna took an eternity to serve everyone and she had to stop and chat and joke with each person while I watched my raviolis. Finally, she sat, I inhaled and the raviolis were gone and I asked for more. Martha laughed as she repeated what was already legend in my half Argentinian beef loving family. Nancy only eats pasta. That's all she eats. And there were cheers and applause and I felt welcomed and accepted into this pasta loving tribe and they understood. That evening when we got home, my mother was in the kitchen beating the costume jewelry she made for work and she looked up from her beating and she asked, so how was the movie? And I blurted out, I ate the best ravioli and felt my sister's hand clamp down on my mouth so fast while she rattled off yet another fictitious movie plot which my mom seemed to enjoy. Then Martha whisked me off to the bathroom, ran the water, threw me in the tub and shampooed my hair as it ran into my eyes. And she said, I'll give you anything. She whispered desperately, I'll buy you any toy you like, but if you tell her about the ravioli, I'll kill you. I got a doll the next day and I never told about the ravioli until now. Thank you so much, Nancy, that was beautiful. Um, all of your readings were so powerful. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to ask a few of my questions right now, and um, while that's going on, I just ask if the audience, um, if you have questions, please post them in the chat so that I can read them afterwards. Um, so all of you can answer for this, um, just feel free. Um, now that it is 20 years after The Milk of Almonds was published and you're being invited to reflect and reread the writing from the anthology, how does it feel to return to these pieces? And what did being a part of this anthology mean to you then? And what does it mean to you now? Yeah, go ahead. So I'd like to, I'd like to start by saying that it was a really daring thing that Ed Vijay and Louise did when they chose to go away from a big publisher and go to the feminist press. The good news about the feminist press is that they don't let books go out of print. So this book is still available and still in print. But I gave them a piece that was an excerpt from a novel that I was writing. And Eddie and Louise had heard me read this essay, this memoir, um, Go to Hell at a conference. And they emailed me, and in those days email felt so slow, right? And said, can we have Go to Hell? 
And I was like, I'm going to give them whatever they want. So I gave them that piece. But here's the generosity that's really important. Louise then gave the piece that I sent them to Regina Barreca for another anthology called The Italian American Reader. She didn't have to do that. I was going to give her whatever she wanted because I was young. I was a young writer. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just honored to be in the anthology. But this is the work of paying it forward. Like Louise was on it. She knew she they wanted, they knew they wanted to go to hell, but then they also forwarded my other work on to another writer, publisher, editor. And then that piece was published in another anthology. The second thing that I wanna say about this experience was that Louise and Eddie were great editors because my piece has some dialect and some slang and the bigger editors at Feminist Press didn't always understand what I was doing. And in truth, I didn't know that I, if I think about it today, I don't know that I knew what I was doing. I was writing what I was feeling, what I was hearing. And it was important to me to have that language. And Louise and Eddie fought for me to keep a lot of the language that I use where I drop consonants and vowels. And I think that that's a really important thing because I think today it's more normal to have second and third languages in anthologies to not try to get people to write in standard American English. But the editors at Feminist Press wanted to standardize my writing and Louise and Eddie fought for me. So I just wanted to say all of that because I think that's really important and speaks to who they were as editors, but also the first experience that I really had working with editors. So thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to answer that question? I can go on to the next one if not. Okay. This was, I'm going to say a little something, which is this essay was the, really the beginning of 28 years of nonstop writing. And uh, I, I was putting, giving them something. They kept saying, this isn't you, Joe. This isn't quite right. And I didn't even know that. And they essentially said, you know, make one more effort. Da, da, da. It just opened a door for me that I didn't even know was in me, really. That's the truth. And I, I, it just changed my life. It was life changing. And Maria, congratulations on your new book. I'm so happy to hear about that. And it's just a joy to be with all of you. I, I want to say a couple of things about, um, about working with Luis de Salvo. And just recently we had, uh, we held a celebration of what was it being our 80th birthday. Um, the Milk of Almonds was my first um, big editorial project. I had edited a special issue of a journal, um, conference proceedings, but this was different. You know, this was uh, this was also working with Luis de Salvo, and Luis was extraordinary because, in spite of her monumental experience, and I was still a newcomer, um, a young academic, we started working on this book around 1997, 1998. Um, I didn't have her stature. Um, Louise was not humble. She just even mess with this idea, humility or pride of it. She just got to work. You worked with Louise. And, um, and I really have this distinct memory of, uh, of her um, kitchen table, which is now, now is in my sister's uh, kitchen. That's a complicated story. I'll tell you another time. And all these beautiful pieces, including the ones uh, uh, you read from tonight, lay there as we were not only um, working on the binge of pieces, but also assembling, like setting a table for all of us, Italian American women writers, uh, with some stories uh, to tell. And what was at the center of the project, uh, we were coming as scholars, as I was as a writer, as I was really at the very beginning. This was the memoir I wrote for the Milk of Almonds, was my, one of my first memoirs. There was joy for the work, the pleasure of the work. And Phyllis, I was touched by what you said about finding the friends. And I think, you know, it's all something that we, we, we can say. <laughs> about all of us, so that we have found uh, our community to be, to, that has brought together both 
professionalism, the seriousness of the commitment of the work, but also the joy of, of uh, um, enjoying each other's company and each other's work. Um, and, and that is something I am so incredibly grateful for. I just want to add that there is just the word generosity is what I think about, you know, when I think about the everything about the book and about Eddie and Louise. Um, and I remember at the time um, when Eddie and Louise had asked me for something for the volume, um, I had just finished Were You Always in Italian? And I had written the I'd written a chapter about dialect and it was Louise who said, um, you know, there's so much about food in here and we can we can do something with this. And, you know, just let me let me have this and let me take a look at it. And then she just edited it beautifully and made it work. Um, and when I come back to this volume, and I've always loved it on my bookcase. It's just a it's I just thought it was beautiful how the feminist press put it out. I was I have to say I was surprised by how large it was. I didn't remember all of those. There's just so many wonderful writers. And I was just, you know, looking through it and reading some of the pieces. Um, it's just so abundanza, you know, it's just so full. It's just such an abundant work. So congratulations again, and thank you again. Thank you all so much. Um, I do have another question. So media portrayal of Italian Americans is often very, uh, very stereotypical with emphasis on pasta, pizza, certain story. Um, and in what ways has the milk of almonds changed stereotypical perceptions of Italian American food and culture? I'll say something. Um, I think it's really important to remember that in the 20th century, the most well-known women writers of Italian descent in the United States were cookbook writers. And so we came from a place where the only time we were allowed to speak was when we were in the kitchen and when we were publishing cookbooks. And I think that this volume in particular showed Italian American women writers in this three-dimensional capacity a capacity for anger, for joy, for love, for, for a love of food and also a complicated relationship with food. And I think that's held us in good stead 20 years later. There are so many books now by Italian American women writers from Annie Lanzalato and Juliet Graham and, and um, Dominica Ruda, you know, that, that really speak to an experience of Italian Americanness that's very different, that shies away or that or that um, is different than the than the tale, uh, the immigrant tale of struggle and then success and assimilation. And so I really appreciate this volume sort of standing at, you know, and building a bridge for those of us that write about more complicated matters. And I'll, I'll shut up now. Um, I wanna add to that, I agree with you, Nancy. Um, and I wanna add, um, add to that because I think what's really so subversive about, about this uh, group of, of writing that's been put, to, was put together under the banner, uh, Eddie and, and Louise, of, of food, because you're like, it's almost like you said, okay, we're known for food. Here's some food. You know, here you go. And and it's shocking. Sometimes it's just it's so um, the violence and the, the 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 manipulations and the fierceness, the love that can be so fierce and all of that stuff. It's just so shattering. All the stereotypes. Um, you know, because we usually go, oh, pa it's passion, but it, this is like passionate. This is like the real deal. <laughs> and um, I feel like wh when I read this, I'm, I'm so thrilled with what you guys accomplished because when we say media, we are, sometimes we, we're thinking of like television and films. We just don't, to this day, 20 years later, we still don't see an Italian American woman that is as varied and as complicated and as coming from different places and as coming from different experiences as you have in this writing. We don't see it. We haven't seen it yet. I agree. It's definitely 
it's definitely its own category and a powerful one at that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, so I do have another question. The experience of food is intertwined with the experience of community, especially with family. Um, when you write about Italian American experiences with food and culture, do you begin with food or do you begin with a broader story and does food surprise you midway through? I'd say this, food is always there <laughs> under all circumstances. It just is a part of us, it's so deeply. I love the fact that when we have meetings, we're gonna eat. We're, that's just deeply a part of us. But of course, there are many, many, many layers to these experiences. And I don't think we always start with that as a, as a starting point at all but it is embedded in us simultaneously. And let those other people have meetings where they sit there and drink water. <laughs> it's not for us. It's not for us. I think one of the things that, that was interesting is, is asking for asking writers like contribute to this food anthology. And, and sometimes, uh, the knee-jerk response is to, to try to get to the food story that is most familiar or what feels like a food story. And as with every act of good storytelling, you kind of have to get out of your way and, and let the story find you. And so some like Jana, you know, we had that back and forth because she had this wonderful story. But the real story, which was magnificent, she was just keeping it to herself until finally we got that, that fantastic piece. Uh, there was another um, writer, Lauren Lipari, and, and she was writing a piece about grandma's soup. And it was, wasn't doing anything of what we wanted the piece to do. Because with the piece, we wanted both the tap and the love and the passion. We also wanted to shake a little bit the foundation. And we went back and forth many times. And she written another piece on, on crack addiction. And um, finally, the breakthrough came. She wrote about crack as food. And she ended up using the instructions to make crack as a kind of recipe. And then the piece became an exploration of the sources of addiction and its roots into immigrant sorrow. So I think sometimes we have we have to start with food, even when that particular food that we focus on is not the focus of the story. And I think this is true in different ways of, of all the pieces that we have heard, that they're not, they're pieces where there is food, but this, there is something about the role of food that, that destabilizes the expectation that the reader may have. Well, I think food is also the bomb. In, it's a culture of, as you say, of a lot of sorrow and a lot of pain, um, but we hold on to the food because it's that little piece of joy. So you're always seeing this interplay of some really awful experiences and then the salvation in, well, we're going to have that plate of pasta. We're going to have, you know, something that, that, that is ours and, uh, and that we love and provides us some joy. I'm, Thank you. I, I just want to say something to you directly. I don't know, you know, how much longer we're going to go on, but you are doing such a beautiful job of leading us through tonight. And your presentation is elegant and warm. And I don't think it gets much better than that. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, I was just about to say I was only one. Uh, when this anthology was published and being able to uh, read and learn about Italian American um, food and culture resonates with me a lot because my ancestors are from Portugal. And so we also have that same connection um, with family and food and community. Um, and so I think focusing on these elements of culture is so important and relatable for readers of all backgrounds. Um, but thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Um, we do have one question from the audience. Um, it asked, was Thanksgiving a holiday in Italian households? If so, what kind of foods were there?
We all have the same Thanksgiving where we had the American meal. We had the, the, the turkey and the potatoes and the stuffing and all of that. And then our actual meal, which was the soup and the raviolis and the meats and the roasts and the, and the 8 million desserts. And when I started bringing Americans home, when my brother-in-law first came home, when my stepchildren first came into my parents' house, I kept saying, just go slow, just, you know, be careful. And they didn't know what I was talking about. I, it's an insane tradition. It's insane, which I think we have finally stopped in this generation, haven't we? I hope, because it was, it was crazy. I'll, you know, I'm half Sicilian and half Irish. So Thanksgiving all depended on where we spent Thanksgiving. Um, and, and things changed as I got older as well. What I always found was not so, the food was always there and the food was great. What I always got frustrated by was that no matter how old I got, I never got to sit at the adult table because there were so many relatives that, you know, and you had to wait for someone to die. So it was this thing of, I want to sit at the adult table, but I don't want, you know, my aunt or somebody to die. And so that I think is part of um, the tradition as well. And I, and I also think that when we talk about food, to go back to the previous question, I think our relationships as women are more complicated to food because especially in Italian American households, I didn't find this so much in Irish American, but Italian American was that we were expected to be the nurturers. So my, when I was growing up, I had a very complicated relationship to food I made for others as opposed to food that I ate for myself. And I would say that it continued on until my 20s and 30s, where I sort started to really just decide this is what I like and this is what I'm going to eat. Um, but yeah, Thanksgiving for me was always about when do I get to the adult table? <laughs> um, I want to thank you all so much again for being here with us tonight. Um, we are now at the end of our event. Um, Dr. Junta, I don't know if you want to say anything else, but I just want to thank you all for being here and um, letting me have this conversation with you. Thank you so much, um, my fellow writers, uh, friends, uh, for coming together on this very um, special evening. Kaylee, you were spectacular and, and such a joy also to be read and hosted by a younger writer, a gifted writer. So we'll be reading your work. And thank you to our audience uh, for joining us and the NGCU Center for the Arts that continues uh, to um, host these events and we have a wonderful calendar um, in the spring. So check out the upcoming events. Thank you so much. Have a good night.